Much less is known about concubines in the harems of Chinese emperors than about the harems of sultans and padishas in the East. And we can say that in the East, concubines were easier in some respects and more difficult in others. You're watching Flip Side of History, the other side of the known history. Today, we will tell you about simply unspeakable things from the lives of concubines in the harems of the Chinese emperors. Well, the laws of the Heavenly Empire officially allowed the Emperor to have only four wives, according to the number of sides of the world. He himself the fifth represented the unity of all the elements and senses in the system. This did not mean, however, that there were only four women in the Imperial Palace. On the contrary, in addition to wives, there were concubines divided into several categories, as well as dancers, singers and maids. If we go only by the hierarchy, each emperor's wife had 12 mates, a concubine of the highest category had 8, a medium one had 6 mates, and a concubine of the lowest category had only 2 mates. In total, according to some estimates, there could have been as many as 40,000 women and girls in the so-called Forbidden City, where concubines lived. With so many representatives of the feminine sex, the emperor himself definitely needed protection from abundance, so quite strict rules of communication were obviously developed. For example, the emperor had the right to have intercourse with his official wife only once a month, and with a concubine of the highest rank up to five times a month. This strange rule is due to the very fact that according to Chinese beliefs, the empress, official wife, had the highest and most pronounced feminine nature, so she could conceive an offspring even after a single intercourse. In contrast to the official wife's concubines who, according to this belief, had a less pronounced feminine nature, required a greater number of attempts. So it was a paradox that concubines had access to the emperor's body much more often than official wives. With so many women craving to get into the emperor's bed within the walls of the Forbidden City, secret intrigues, mobs and jealousies often reached such a pitch that even the founder of the Ming dynasty, Ming Zhu Yongzheng, was forced to create a rule. Never allow the willful power of the occupant of the chief court to be exercised by any of the secondary wives and concubines. For every night they visit the sovereign's chambers, there is an order of succession. But intrigues aside, the process of sleeping with the emperor was more regulated than the instructions for firing the unique Wehrmacht Dora gun. The overall management of the process was carried out by eunuchs, who had more power in the harem than even the most beloved concubines. So, before the night, a eunuch would find the desired concubine, or wife, and hand her a card with the sign of the monarch's favor. After that, the chosen concubine was stripped naked, smeared with incense, and then the concubine, also naked, waited for permission. The lack of clothing was explained by the safety, so that the concubine could not carry a knife or other weapon in the folds of her clothes. After the girl was ready, a eunuch messenger entered the room and, wrapping the chosen one in a coverlet of heron's wool, took her to the emperor's bedchamber. In the bedchamber itself, the eunuch removed the cloak, and the concubine leaped under the blanket. There are two traditions of the act of copulation itself. The first one, dating back to the Ming dynasty. The emperor's mother or a senior female maid of honor or someone else was always present in the bedchamber, until the end of the act, if necessary advising the concubine on the best way to do or to act. In addition, a separate eunuch recorded everything that happened and wrote down the procedure in red ink. Later it was such records that became the basis for Chinese erotic writings. Later, during the Qing dynasty, the eunuchs simply waited outside the door. Here it should be noted that the highest caste of eunuchs, the so-called Chamber of Chief Affairs, was concerned solely with ensuring the smooth and high-quality process of intercourse itself. Also, the rules of the Qing dynasty specified that the emperor could not keep his concubine until morning, when, in the opinion of the chief warder of the House of Chief Affairs, time was running out, he would loudly declare, It's about time! And, if needed, he could repeat this phrase several times, until the bedchamber door was opened. After the emperor presented his happy, happy face after the intercourse, he was asked several questions. The first question was, to keep or not to keep? This question concerned the grace with which the emperor bestowed the concubine. In case of consent, a corresponding entry was made in a special book, when and who had been marked by the emperor's mercy, so that in case of pregnancy this entry could already serve as an excuse. If the emperor gave a negative answer, the girl was pressed hard on her belly to make the seed come out. In this case, no records were made. Unlike concubines, the emperor could visit his wife on his own. But still, the visit was necessarily recorded by the eunuchs, and after the act itself, the eunuch expected a signal from the emperor. 
If the Son of Heaven said, go away, no records were made, as this meant that the coitus process had not taken place. In the opposite case, a note was made similar for concubines. On this day, this month of this year, at this hour, the Tsar made the Empress happy. There were times when the Emperor would not say a single word, then the eunuch would kneel and ask the Emperor for a hint as to what to do. In their free time, the concubines lived quite carefree, enjoying learning various skills, dancing and simply living in luxury. Also, all of the residents of the Forbidden City were paid a living allowance, which was, by the way, not insignificant. However, this could not last long. Older concubines, and also many of the younger ones, were engaged in household duties. Laundry, cleaning, cooking in the kitchen, growing silkworms, creating various aromatic blends, dyeing fabrics, and sewing clothes. But besides the facade, there was another, hidden life that was carefully concealed behind the splendor and luxury of the Chinese emperor's court. Concubines could be simply kicked out of the palace for a variety of reasons, such as loss of beauty, childlessness, violation of rules, and ironically such fates were still quite good. Many concubines in the harem ended their lives by suicide. There was a restriction. If a concubine took poison, her whole family was to be executed. So the only option was death by starvation or, as an especial mercy, the right to throw herself into a well or a gold plate scent, after swallowing which, the unfortunate woman died by asphyxiation. Some elderly concubines lived out their lives peacefully in the corners of the forbidden city, but not all were granted such an opportunity. If a girl was not among those close to the emperor who had the right to see him from time to time, her fate could be horrible. The same was true of those who fell out of favor with the emperor. Such individuals were entirely at the mercy of the eunuchs. Having actually lost their manhood, many of them, while retaining what was left of their sexual attraction, abused the outcast concubines as best they could. They just rubbed against them, biting and beating them, and sometimes they could simply kill them with absolutely no punishment for that. But death was not the worst of all. The frequent beatings left scars in the girl's traces, and in ancient China, a girl's scar was a sign of rejection. She no longer had any chance outside the palace, not only to create a new family, but to even receive the basic minimum of compassion and any empathy. Neglected outcast beauties were often banished from the palace, outside of which they became an object of taunts and mockery. The spoiled flower, marked with scars, was doomed to wither in shame, humiliation and poverty. Besides, despite the brilliance of the exterior, its backside concealed far more sinister things. For example, it sometimes led to hunger riots. During the reign of the Ming Emperor Jia Jing, for instance, the Son of Heaven could simply beat a concubine to death for fun, allowing the eunuchs to do the same to girls they did not like. For any offense, unfortunate girls were brutally beaten, often to death. According to some reports, during the reign of Jia Jing, at least 200 harem dwellers died from beatings alone. Moreover, about 10,000 concubines and about 9,000 eunuchs served in his court. It was natural that men, no matter who they were, could take food away from weak girls, so death among concubines from starvation was a common thing. The girls, driven to despair, even dared to kill the emperor. The attempt was made on October 21, 1542, when several concubines, having thrown a noose around the emperor's neck, began to strangle him. Jia Jing was saved by chance. The news was made incorrectly, so he managed to wake up and resist it. In the end, his wife came running at the noise and saved the son of heaven's life. The ringleader and her 15 companions were dismembered, and their heads displayed on poles. Moreover, the rebellious women's families were oppressed as well. Ten were executed and the rest became slaves. Thank you for watching this video. Subscribe to Flip Side of History and do not hesitate to leave a like.